It's all right. Oh. <laughs> I put the cover over the lens. There you go. What can you do? Just shoot me now. Save everyone the trouble, isn't it? All right, everyone. It's been a long week. You see Arnie in the background. I'm supposed to edit you out. There you go. You'll be edited out in a minute. Right, okay, so as you know, it's been a long week. And thank you very much for everyone's messages of support and help in this difficult time. But uh, anyway, so get back to the subjects in hand. And it's a lot tonight. Now, one of the things I do want to mention, a little update on things during the week. As you know, last week was the summer solstice. So we did lots of stuff there, observations, visiting sites. Unfortunately, I got a bit rained out and some bad weather. So I didn't get everything we wanted. But... The good news is there is a lot of progress and I'm going to try and get some more videos up during the week about that. Now, the main project has been to get the, as you know, Trojan War of 650 BC. Here's their copy of the original by Wilson and Blackett. Been organising a reprint. Things have been slow with people on furloughs and all sorts of stuff. I'm just about ready to get to print. And the wonderful uh, Mrs. Carnegie contacted me about various things and has got loads of good information on this book and other things and said, really need to have an index. <laughs> so I thought, ha ha! Oh no, that'd be a huge job. But anyway, it was a great idea. And I'm very glad to be spending, to slow things up slightly. But I think you'll see when the book comes out, it's going to be really worth it because there's so much information jammed in there. So I've done a printout just to give you an idea. Oops, excuse me, and there's page after page after page of all different kind of, uh, almost just by every name that's mentioned in the books. It's mostly names. There's a couple of events and places, nearly always names. And there's over 500, I have the exact count, pages and pages, triple columns. So that'll be in the reprint, that'll be in the book, all right? Maybe I'll make that available uh, separately as well for people who've already got the book. Although I recommend most heartily you buy the new book with the index and also being a reprint. You won't feel so bad about, you know, scribbling your own notes in the sides um, like I tend to do on my books. <laughs> so, well, one of the things I noticed, though, what a brilliant exercise it was. Because when I got my copy of the Trojan War, I was full steam having just read Moses in the Hieroglyphs. And for me, it was all about uh, the Hieroglyphs and the Egyptians and the chronology and then, of course, as the title suggests, the Trojan War of 650 BC. Oh, good to see the comments. I'll say hello in a second. What I did, as a result, I kind of jumped through the first part of the book. And when you look at it again, the first two, three hundred pages are actually all about Welsh and British history. And there's loads of good stuff in there you just wouldn't expect. For example, the story of uh, William Wallace. Wallace being derived from the word Welsh. Mm. Wouldn't expect that, would you? So I'll do a little video on that one, actually, because it's quite interesting. But then we've got, just walking through some of the A's, page one is just A's and a bit of B's. So you've got, obviously, all about Brutus and uh, the concept of British barbarism, how that was introduced. we got Leslie Alford, uh, lots of long Assyrian names, of course, for the second half of the book. And stuff about the Ark of the Covenant. A lot of stuff about um, Arthur I, which we need to talk about. We haven't talked much about Arthur I, so we'll be doing that soon. So this book is almost three books again, because you've got all the Welsh history at the front, the Trojan War, all the hieroglyphs, all that kind of ancient stuff. And right at the back, which I have to confess I had more or less missed the first few times I read the book, is a lot about the migration. And if you know that famous, wonderful um, presentation that Alan Wilson gives at ARC 3 that Karen Sawyer organised, when he just goes on all about and the box and they took everything and uh, Obadidam family, the whole migration, the Ark of the Covenant moving. I won't do the whole thing today. and uh, But a lot of that is almost word for word in the book. It shows how amazing his mind is. It's like he just sort of uh, downloads into books or into speech and holds all that information. So that's going to be the basis of what we're talking about here. Right, so quick look at some of the comments for that. Hello, Chris Woods, yeah, all the regular crew. Legolas is here. Black screen, yeah, thank you. We fixed that, hopefully. Hello from Canada. Oh, how cool is that? Someone from Ontario, Canada. There we are. Which, oh, I'll try which city. There's um, our one famous ancestor is Fred Broadstock. And somewhere in Canada, might be Ontario, there's the Fred Broadstock pool. 
So there you go. Next time you dive in, you see the Fred Broadstock pool. That's like, I don't know, my great, great uncle. And the little side story, the family heirlooms, <laughs> apparently, I didn't even know he had any, okay? Uh, you can see them in, oh, which is the city? Oh, no. Anyway, the city, there. I should know this and go and visit, really. If you look in the look, um, when he died, he had no children or anything, okay? This is one of the reasons there seems to be very few broadstocks in the world. An awful lot of bachelors who go off around the world adventuring never have any family or anything. So he has left, right, all this amazing stuff to the city, and it's like proper treasure, you know, gold plates and spoons. And he's a war hero in the Boer War, and he met Victoria, and then he picked up some terrible disease, and he went to Canada for the climate. I don't even know what the Canadian winters are like. I wonder what that was about. But well, there we go. The, the 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 dry air. Something went beep. Oh, well, I think it's okay. So, there we go. That's my connection. So, hello, hello, hello to Linda, all the way from Canada. Hi, Nikki. Hi, Luke. David. Rob. Zoe. Hmm, Mr. Boyle. Mrs. Boyle. Hi, Ross and all. Yes, we speak a lot. I don't know some of the people's names. People have these. Uh, it's Hugh Evans. Right, anyway, so we're going to crack on. So, what we're going to do, and I think I know... A big subject for a lot of people is uh, the tribe of Dan as well, and the the the, the, the tribes moving around with the Spartans. And I've got some extra stuff to add as well. I'm not just rehashing what's in the book, as you will see in a minute. Okay, so I'm going to put a few graphics on screen, and I'm going to try and live feed some video or some. Uh, oh, I've got to turn my phone off. That's probably a really bad idea. Can you turn it off for me. Um. You know, sharing of the stream and that. Uh, so, just a little bit of that. Okay, so I'm just kick things off. And I'm going to do... Right, this is where I have to be clever a second. So, just bear with me. Oh! Let's see if we get a really ugly first screen with some big text. Yay, that's come out lovely. Okay, it's on the screen. Slightly off to the right. Oh, well. The only word you're missing is the second half of there, Okay. Right, okay, so I'm just going to dive straight in now. It's necessary, this is, uh, if you've got the book, page 460 of The Trojan Wars, book by Wilson and Blackett. So what we're talking about, first of all, is the importance of The Trojan Wars and how it fits in, okay? So I'm just going to bring up... Thank you. Just let people know which part of the world we're talking about. And this is, you have to give it an attribution when I've used someone's work, and it's someone called... Town down. So their mother was very creative in that one. Right. So they got the solid evidence that the ten tribes of Israel were known as the Cymri. And as the Cymri, these people were deported from their homelands in Israel, Palestine, by the kings of Assyria in several successive mass deportations between 740 and 702. All right. So this is the area of the Middle East we're looking at. It's like mostly Saudi Arabia. And we've got UAE. Around here, Abu Dhabi, where my son was born. A little sticky out bit there. And then we'll zoom in a second. You've got, obviously, uh, Iraq, Iran, Turkey, all these kind of things. Egypt is over here. So this is what's generally known as the Middle East, okay? Oh, I thought another map next. Yeah, here we go. I'll go back to him a second. That's Sennacherib. Right, so this is the... Uh, I found this on here. This is just on Wikipedia. So I haven't checked the accuracy particularly, but it gives you an idea how they were deported back and forth, okay? So, uh, right, okay, so when the um, Assyrian king emperor Sennacherib was murdered in a temple by his two of his sons, it's a nice thought, isn't it? Then there became a war, war between his heir, and I'll put all his names on the screen, Esaradun. Right, so the Ten Tribe Confederation took advantage of this tumultuous situation, and they gathered and took off going west across both branches of the Euphrates and through the Taurus Mountains. So I've left this on the screen for a moment, so you can see here, this is the Euphrates, and there's the one branch, there's the other branch. So up, these are the deportation arrows. At some point, they've legged it this way. And they come up through here. Ooh, hang on. Sorry, go back, it's back, 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 back. How do I go back quickly? Previous. All right, control P next time. All right. <laughs> Just shoot me now. Here we go. All right, so they've gone through there, and I'll show you a map of a moment of them. Um, the other Taurus Mountains are here. So as uh, Alan Wilson and Blackett say in the book, they've gone west that way. And this is quite important. 
I'm not sure how much people have picked up on that. Now, this is sort of area at that time, and what we're looking at here is the old Assyrian uh, Empire. This is a foreign website, and what I noticed, there's a part of this area already. Kimaros, that could be to do with the Cymru. Cymru. So we'll come into that, and I'll put a link up so you can have your look yourself. All right. Now, if you go on to Wikipedia, you can find out all about Esarhaddon, and what you'll see there, it, all this stuff so far is backed up by the old school, the mainstream. You can see the dates match, uh, the people match. Oh, what's this? Oh, hang on a second. Sorry, some uh, just got distracted then by a couple of comments. We'll come back to those in a minute, okay? All right, this is what I wanted. Here we go. So now, so the, the migration is taking place here. They're coming across here west, across these rivers, across the Taurus Mountains, and to this kind of area here. Now, what I want to talk about, sorry, I've left the book a bit, haven't I, really? But um, if you're looking, this is the key strategic position. Because up here, you've got the Black Sea, and over here, you've got the Mediterranean. And one thing I want to point out, if you remember, we talked previously when uh, the Mabinogi gives directions, the, the code. Well, one of the things to bear in mind is the Black Sea, black in uh, the old Welsh directions in the Cymric, represents north. And sure enough, there's the there's the Black Sea up the north, and the Red Sea's in the west, which if you remember, it, it was in the west from where they were previously. don't know if that's significant or true or whatever, but there you go, that fits in. And something I want to bring into this discussion, which um, I never heard Alan or uh, Baron mention, is these people called the Luwians. Well, in English, we call it Luwians. They've got Luwier here, which I think, I'm not sure what language that is. But what you can see, it's exactly the same area. This is the same area. Taurus Mountains are here, and these Luwians. Now, what's it going to try and do? I've got this all queued up ready, so hopefully it'll work nice and easy. Uh, hang on. There we go. If you go on to uh, Wikipedia, you might not have heard the Luwians before. L-U-W-I-A-N-S. Now, look at these, because I've got a pet theory, if you like, that um, the Luwians, who no one seems to know who they are, might actually be these lost tribes becoming known as the Cymru it fits in with the migration story. All right, it's got a little bit extra coming in today. So if you read what it says on Wikipedia, it's a group of Anatolian peoples, well, that's pretty vague, who lived in Central Western and Southern Asia Minor, as well as the northern part of Western Levant. Now, the Levant is very much the area we're talking about with um, Palestine, Israel, Judea. And they spoke the Luwian language, which they don't really know what that is. Does anything come up? It's a group of languages within the Anatolian branch of the Indo-European. I mean, it's all very vague. And it would seem to trace back to um, the ancient Assyrians. And like we know with Cymric, the Welsh language goes all the way back to Mesopotamia. And from that. So it's written, it even says here, it's written in cuneiform, imported from Mesopotamia. Which is the area where the Cymri and the Lost Tribes have come from. So if their writing comes from there, I would have thought there's a pretty good chance their language comes from there as well. And the other one, I'm really hoping that people in the group will have a look at, because I really want to, just trying to find the time to do it, is look at their own hieroglyphic script, which is different to Egyptian hieroglyphs. And many people say it's like, uh, you know, Kotepi Teki, which must be at 15, 20,000 years old. I've got a feeling it's 650 BC, and it's nowhere near as old, and it's something that's been brought from Egypt by the Cymru, or what became known as the Luwians. Oh, by the way, the name Luwians just refers to the type of terrain you got there. You've got like a sort of, um, oh, we got comments about Armenia there. Can you look at those? Yes, Armenia is definitely part of this, not on the map. Just over this side, we got towards Armenian part. Anyway, the, the thing with um, the hieroglyphs and that, I would say they're a descendant of the Egyptian hieroglyphs, part of this migration, perhaps. It's almost impossible to date stones, so I'm a bit sceptical about those massively old dates for Gotepi Teki. Anyway, that's a slight thing. Anyway, look at this. The origin of the Luwians can only be assumed. They've got no idea. A wide variety of suggestions exist even today, which are connected to the debate of the original homeland of the Indo-European speakers. 
Tell me which part of this does not fit with them being the Cymru. Suggestions for the Indo-European homeland include the Balkans, the Lower Volga and Central Asia. However, little can be proven about the route that led the ancestors of the Luwians to Anatolia. It is also unclear whether the separation of the Luwians from the Hittites and the Palaic speakers occurred in Anatolia or earlier. Well, that's this. Different language route. So there you go. you got the whole thing about them, and you can read this yourself. Look up Luwians. And what's very interesting as well is that the Luwians seem to disappear. <laughs> and the dates. Another reason why it's so important to get the Trojan War on the right dates. If you move those dates to the Trojan War... From 1200 to 650, then everything fits. The, 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 the reason I would say that they're struggling, the people who are doing the research on the Luwians, is that they're, they're labouring under the, the conception that the Trojan War uh, took place around about 1250 or 1300 even, or even 1400, take a guess, pick a number. Bring it to 650, all the gaps disappear. There's no such thing. Hang on with it. Oh, there we are. Someone could talk to Turkish soldiers in World War One. That is fascinating. So far, but I can't see it. I think it's... There we are. There's a. I'm going to just click you, Arnie. There is. A... This is from Rhythmistic. Thank you very much. And he says there is a town in Armenia called Gumri. During World War One, my dachi captured some Turkish soldiers and found he could understand them. I think it's Tadki. Tadki. Thank you, Arnie. It's enough from you. <laughs> <laughs> little scene stealer here and they were speaking welsh or a dialect of oh that's fantastic gumry in armenia and we've got luke davis talking about that. that's absolutely brilliant so we'll have to look more into that because there was someone now um, before contacted me who had their uh, family from armenia and if it's the same person because it's not the real names on the screens and we we're, were really trying to follow this up about uh, the you know what the connections between the countries are and possibly georgia which is not a lot far from there. It does all seem to connect. Anyway, sorry, I'm di diverting as always, but there we are, that's the fun sometimes, isn't it? The diversions. Right, so in their march across Asia Minor, uh, sorry, some, some may have gone north through the Caucasus and around the Black Sea towards the Crimea. And, there, and if you look at E.O. Gordon's book, um, Prehistoric London, he even says that Crimea, Crimea, is a corruption of the word Cymru. Cymria became Crimea. But, uh, now, this would be how and why the Assyrian king appealed to his allies, the Scythians, to pursue these groups and prevent them from migrating out of his empire. He didn't want to lose all these people. Anyway, in their march across Asia Minor, the main group of the Cymru, there was very little that the various kingdoms scattered across Asia Minor could do to prevent their relentless passage westwards. We're going west. We're moving further and further towards uh, the area that's considered to be Troy. And uh, right, uh, the Cymru, the the the, the Cymru, sorry, are identified by Greek writers as the Cimmeroi or the Cimmerians, or Cimmerians, as they crossed Asia Minor by 650 BC. They had reached the great capital city of Sardis and captured it, but they could not take the whole citadel in the city centre, and they had reached the Dardanelles. Now this is, I know, I'm really hoping that um, Stephen watches this week. Stephen Pigeon, Doctor Stephen Pigeon. And he said, this is one of those places named after the Dan, the tribe of Dan. I love the way he says it. Dan. Dardanelles. So, if the Trojan War took place around 650 BC, then the scenario makes sense. Half of the people went to Eritrean Italy, and the other half remained near Byzantium in known named towns. And I think, I, I, I need to speak to Alan Wilson about this and Barham. These people here, these Luwians, I think are the missing link. Because they disappear from history. Well, we know where they went, yeah? The second half of the Cymric nation, the Ten Tribes, remained near the Dardanelles until around 500 BC, when they joined a mass expedition of at least three groups, and their military forces sailed for the great island of Albine under Brutus, the great grandson of Aeneas of Troy. All this can be shown from the records, and the fact that inscriptions in the same identical alphabet were left all along the route from their original homelands into and into Albine or Albion, which became Brutus land, which is now Britain. Anyone doubting this is invited to read the mass of ancient British Cymric records and to look at the alphabet and the decipherments. And all this is in the King Arthur Conspiracy published in 2005. And we're going to do follow-up follow -up volumes, each based on each subject. As you know, we've got the one about the birth of Christianity coming out, well, any time now, really. 
and then do another one on migrations, another one on Roman myth, and anyway. Right, if, if we move it back to 1200 BC, then it doesn't make any sense, you see, the Trojan War. Because the biblical records and Flavius Josephus show that King uh, Jehoash, the king of ten tribe Israel, totally defeated King Hazia of two tribe Judea around 790 BC. So if King Jehoash took the defeat of Isaiah with him to Jerusalem, where he tore down 200 metres of the city walls, as you can see the archaeology. He then proceeded to take everything from the palace, and he also took everything from the temple, and he also took the family of Obed-Edom. This family of Obed-Edom were the family assigned to be the guardians of the Ark of the Covenant, and taking everything from the Jerusalem temple would have included the Ark. And there's a lot more about the Ark, which I'm not going to cover tonight. But as a lot of you know, Seems to know the burial place of that up into in a glow. So at the same as the same alphabet written in the same language is scattered all along the migration route from Israel to Asia Minor, the Aegean, Aegean, Aegean Islands where the fleets gathered in 500 BC, to Etruria in 650 BC, and then Britain onwards. All right, so we've got loads of inscriptions and stuff. I'd very much like people to read this, and I might actually just read it during the week and record it. Leave some comments if people like me to do that. And I'll just read it so you can listen at some other time, okay? Because it's a lot to cover in one go. Oh, yeah, take that off. <laughs> All right, so um, so what he's saying is there, uh, the Ark of the Covenant's there, okay? So we're jumping forward to it now. So everything boils down, sorry, I'm jumping forward to page 463. Everything boils down to a series of cultural comparisons between relics and practices of the Cymric Welsh nation and those of the ancient nations of the Near East, including Israel. Right, now we're going to jump ahead to page 474, and we come on to the next subject, which is who are the Greeks, and who are the Spartans, which is kind of linked, and this is why I want this map, because one of the things, before I start reading this, I really want to bring home, first of all, is the strategic importance of controlling this Bosphorus, seeing there's the Black Sea, Red Sea, Mediterranean, this is the main trading route in and out of all this area. It's pretty much all got to feed through there, okay? And when we talked about the migrations, we saw them go to Egypt, the ancient Assyrian emperor, they moved them all around here. And finally they headed west, across the Taurus Mountains, ended up here, Dardanelles, in this kind of area. All right? I was, oh, hang on a second. I'm going to go, oh, jump in the gun now. I thought I had a zoom-in map. Anyway, one look at this, this area, how important Egypt is to all this. There's Israel, that's how close Egypt is. And if you look at the Odyssey, we've got another book come out about this, about the great uh, circumnavigation of the world, which is the Odyssey, not just the Med. No one could spend three, four years or ten years sailing around the Mediterranean. You'll hit the edges too often. But if you follow the Odyssey, the journey is down this coast and this is where there's the storms and stuff, and he meets the old man, and he has the fates told. And they come around here, and they end up there. And uh, it clearly says they're in Egypt, and then the journey sets off down the Red Sea. That's what I'll be doing soon. The book's just about ready to go, just waiting on the cover. And and then we're done. Anyway, so, where the, where the Greeks seem to have settled from here is down in this area. This is what we call the Delta area. It looks like the letter D, letter Delta, from the old uh, alphabets. And there's lots of little rivers and streams. I've been around there. It's a fabulous area. You get completely lost. It's very flat. Little streams and rivers, and you can see why it divides up so easily. So anyway, back to the book. So what are these powerful Greek city kings? Greek city kings? So what seems to have happened is a collection here of 22 little Greek states, all vying to become pharaoh. And to do that, you've got to marry into the pharaoh's family, which is the wife, which is why we get this Trojan War problem. So how do they get there? And how do the Greeks get into Greece itself? Where do they come from and when? All the mummies of the pharaohs of the 19th dynasty are clearly European Aryan. Now, how weird is this? I don't know if everyone's aware of this. We always think of Egyptians as fairly dark-skinned. Uh, I've got another website here. Here we go. This uh, one I picked up, looking for this, because I, I was looking for the pictures. I've used them before, and they're in the new book about the circumnavigation. If you look closely, stop bobbing up and down. Anyway, 
Here's a whole set of mummies from that era. And there's two things that you notice. One is that a lot of them have red hair. They have white skin, but that might just be faded, people say, or it could be the painting style. They give lots of reasons for that. Apart from it might actually just be white. But they've also got blue eyes, which takes a lot of explaining. Nearly all of them, well, I think all of them have got blue eyes. Most of them have got red hair. And this ties in with some of the Irish claims about links to Egypt. And you've got uh, Irish Freemasonry links to Egypt. So there's a lot of very interesting things going on there. But also, also what it shows in the Wilson and Blackett books is that these were connected to Greece. And that the person there shown as Ramesses II is actually Necho II, who is the same person as Agamemnon. Or Menelaus. I need to double check. Menelaus and Agamemnon are both two of the mummies, all right? Necho 1 and Necho 2. So I just need to check the area, uh, order. So it's worth looking at all this stuff. There's it's far more to it than you realise. It's not just moving the dates around. Now, these white-skinned people, with their blue eyes, get explained by being the Greek city-states. All right, so get back to what we're saying there. So there are ancient notations on the matter of Greek origins, but these are generally ignored as matters of any in-depth academic researches. I'm going to jump the gun slightly. What we're looking at here is there may be people in Egypt might have come from somewhere else first and then to Greece, or do they go from Greece to Egypt? Starts getting interesting, doesn't it? There are mentions of a powerful people named as the Danans, D A N A A N S, who were involved in the Trojan War. And yet, in the list of the Greeks and their allies, these Danans are not mentioned at all. There is no need to mention them, as the founder of Greek colonization from Egypt, as Danaeus, and he enacted that all the people should be known as the Danans. Naturally, they are not listed in the peoples who were involved on the Trojan side in the war. They're the Greeks. So what we're saying is that they're all Danans. So when you're listing all the different kings who turned up to fight in the Trojan War, that's kind of the umbrella title, which is why you would never hear. There's no one actually... So if you say, let's list all the British regiments, none of them are called British Regiment. They're all like Staffordshire Regiment, South Wales Regiment. You know, that's the kind of idea, as, as I read it. So the immediate possibility is that these Danans were the descendants of the powerful Israelite tribe of Dan. In a phantom Trojan War of around 1334, or 1135, around about there, the involvement of the tribe of Dan would appear to be highly unlikely. It's actually almost impossible. It doesn't tie in with the Bible or any other historical references. But once you move to 650 BC, boom! It all starts to make sense. So then we've got the Spartans, who are the major participants in this war of 650 BC. We find some strange evidence. Uh-oh. I'm going to be clever now. Put my bomb. I can do this. Yes. Red ahead. Egyptian mummies, blue-eyed mummies. Yeah. Okay. There's a curious one. Okay. That's the Spartan shield on the left. Does anyone recognize what the shield on the right is? So in his books on the... Anyway, well, that's the Glamorgan shield on the right. It just suddenly struck me. They've both got that kind of uh, chevron pointing upwards. So I think uh, Wilson and Blackett definitely allude to this in uh, looking at hieroglyphs and things. Anyway, sidetracking. So on his books on the Antiquities of the Jews, and in Book 12, Chapter 4, Section 10, penned around 70 AD, Flavius Josephus records that the Lacedaemon Spartans were kinsmen of the Israel people. This also appears in the Maccabees, Book 1, Chapter 12. In the Antiquities, there is, and there's the quote, Areas, king of the Lacedaemonians, to Anias sendeth greetings. And then we have met with a certain writing, this is in quotes now, whereby we have discovered that both the Judeans and the Lacedaemonians are of one stock and are derived from the kindred of Abraham. It is just, it is but just, therefore, that you who are our brethren, should send us to us about your concerns as you please. We will do the same thing, and esteem your concerns as our own, and will look upon our concerns as in common with yours. Demoteles, who brings you this letter, will bring your answer back to us. This letter is four square, and the seal is an eagle with a dragon in its claws. And there's a lot more quotes then from the first book of Maccabeans, slightly different and talking about the relationship between the two. 
So, right, so, uh, once again, I'm to bring in another part of this now. Um, sorry, there's a big, I don't read all of that. Anyway, other researchers have noted that right, there would be, appear to be no doubt whatsoever that the Spartans and the Israel people were of common ancestry. It is significant that the emblems that are mentioned in the text of these letters are those of the eagle with a serpent or dragon in its claws. These are the emblems associated with the numerous tribes of Dan, sorry, numerous tribe, singular, of Dan, as in the biblical, biblical references, and they are also the emblems of the Spartans. Other researchers have noted the blood ties and ancestral links between the Israel people and the Spartans, but they have always been handicapped by the fraudulent dating of the Trojan War some 550 years or more before it actually took place. This chronological dislocation of this major historical conflict served to confuse any proper evaluation of the evidence. A chronological dislocation of 550 years would confuse anyone. <laughs> Another minor point is that in the course of their decipherments of the Egyptian hieroglyphics, it became clear to Baron Blackett and Alan Wilson that a snake was the legless creature that we all know as snakes. But a serpent was the legged creature that we recognize in the crocodile and the lizard. Serpents were also regarded as being dragons. This is how these ancient texts speak of a dragon lizard held in the claws of the eagle. And one last thing on that, the biblical record of Jacob's designation of emblems to his 12 sons includes the reference to the tribe of Dan. And Dan shall be a serpent by the way. And then, of course, another major difficulty has been the percent propensity of 18th and 19th century scholars to classify ancient nations as seafarers or landlocked agrarians, or call them agriculturalists or herdsmen and so on. And the prejudgment judgment has always been the descendants of Abraham were landlubbers who herded sheep and goats, and that is patently incorrect. And then there's uh, quite a few examples there that they give over time of people becoming moving from being landlocked to suddenly building huge navies and becoming seafarers, and the reverse. So this idea that um, it's always troubled me a bit as well, that they're always on land and they're always at sea, therefore the two can't cross. So oh, we've got someone here saying, uh, Alexandros, oh my goodness, Hispanicos. He says the Dorians were indeed Danites. This is one of my favourite subjects to study. That of Israel, Israelites' identity and migrations and how they're significant in the founding of Western Europe or Western civilization. Yes, thank you. I agree. Yeah, it's very interesting. Um, it's also interesting how the, the Welsh, the Cymru, always get missed out of it. <laughs> we just assume to have grown up out of the earth in Britain in these sort of primitive mud, flat, mud that we just love to live in. Right, anyway. Uh, da, da, da. So I, I will say a little bit about that, actually, because there is... In, according to uh, Wilson and Blackett, page 482, let's take a breath. There is in fact plentiful evidence that the tribe of Dan in particular, and probably members of the other 12 tribes of Israel, were vigorous seafarers. When Joshua divided up the lands of Canaan between the 12 tribes of Israel, he allotted lands in the northwest near Sidonian territory to the tribe of Dan. These areas were either too small or not sufficiently fertile to support the numerous tribe of Dan, and the Dan leaders quickly organised an expedition of 600 men who seized the city of Laish and its surrounding territories. The Amorites' population proved to be very difficult to dislodge, and the pressure was on to get more land, and it is clear that throughout the entire areas of Canaan and Sidon, large numbers of the existing non-Hebrew populations were not exterminated, as the policy of total genocide had demanded. You can see the things in Judges in the Bible. These people continue to live as second-class citizens throughout the territories of the states of Judah and Israel. Ah, oh, Joshua, that's uh, Joshua 9. And the coast of the children of Dan went out little for them. Now, the reason why he's mentioned this particularly is, I'll just paraphrase a bit, that what Wilson Blackett shows, the treatment of these people and how they set up society with kind of a warrior elite with working serf subclasses, as shown in the Bible, is also a similar or the same approach taken by the Spartans. They had their helots, who were treated as kind of subhumans, who did a lot of the donkey work and 
anyway, just subhumans. Anyway, so that's a remarkable parallel between the two. Dan, as a person, was the fifth son of Jacob, and his mother was Bila, the maidservant of Rachel. The only recorded son of Dan is Hashim, also known as Shuham. Many scholars have noticed that Jacob's pronouncement on Dan indicating a foretelling that the tribe of Dan would in some way be separate and self-governing. And he goes on about Dan will govern his own people. And there's lots more quotes, and I think I've gone on long enough on that. So I want to jump ahead to is to talk about, quickly, you might have noticed this map I've already put on the screen about the Phoenicians. Because they are very mysterious, and I know there's a lot of people out there in the group who I've spoken to or have messaged me, we've exchanged emails about the Phoenicians. They keep cropping up all the time. Who the heck were they? Is it just some sort of federation of people? Is it? It doesn't seem to be a particular race as such. Was it many races joining up as a trading empire? And this this part seems to shed some light on that. Right, okay, I'll come back to some of the comments in a minute, not to lose the thread, I think. So, uh, I know there's a bit more. There we are. Right, there's an area of the eastern coast of the Mediterranean known as Phoenicia. But there does not appear to have been any nation that was specifically known as the Phoenicians. The general area of Phoenician, Phoenicia was a narrow strip of land stretching along the coastline from Latakia in the north to Carmel in the south. We're talking about the east side, which on the map we're looking at, you can see Biblos, Sidon, Tyre as the main area, okay? That the tribe of Dan moved into areas near Mount Hermon, annexed land some 20 miles from the great seaport of Tyre is a fact. When encamped, the 12 tribes had been arranged in groups of three on the four sides of a square around the Ark. And therefore, it is no accident that the three tribes of Asher, Dan, and Manasseh were grouped into territory and conquered Canaan, that lay alongside the Phoenician coastal strip and close to the great trading cities of Tyre and Sidon. And then the other thing, which uh, I'm not going to go into detail now, but it also mentions the journeys of Solomon's fleets combining with the fleets of Tarshish. And if you read the whole of this book, The Trojan Wars, Tarshish, Wilson and Blackett make a very good argument to show that Tarshish is actually Troy. It's the same city, which again, once you change the dating, your Bible makes more sense, the stories make more sense, and you find the whole story of uh, Moses and Joseph. All the dates, everything fits. It's like magic. Uh, one of the points he mentions, I see there's a little bit of points there. I know this is a popular subject. There was some ancient kinship between the people of the coast in the ports of Tyre, Sidon, Acre, and Dor. Appears to be evident. As there's no warfare between these seaport cities and the invading 12 tribes under Joshua. So something must have happened. They must have known each other or something. In the division of Canaanite lands among the twelve tribes of Israel, the ports of Sidon, Tyre, Acre, and Dor were specifically apportioned to the tribes of Asher and Manasseh, which gives a reason for Dan claiming to have insufficient access to the shores. The ancient prince named as Sidon, who would give his name to the seaport of Sidon that he founded, was recorded as being a grandson of Ham and was the son of Noah. Sorry, Ham was the son of Noah. And so the basis for ancient kinship between the people of Israel and the people of the seaports along the Phoenician coastline may have its foundation in this ancient common origin. Almost at the end, okay? The friendship between Solomon and Hiram of Tyre and Sidon and their cooperation in providing the timber necessary for building of Solomon's temple is evidence of this. I think people familiar with the Bible would know all that. We will send down, we will send you wood and tell us what you need. We also cover there, now this ties in with the Exodus, all that kind of thing. Uh, one more point I want to mention there. What is plain and obvious is that the twelve ancient, is that the ancient historians had matters quite correctly, and that the Spartans and the twelve tribes of Israel were of common stock, and origin appears to be a fact. Equally has been amply proved in their other books, the Cymry of Britain are the Kimaroi, known to the Greeks in ancient Asia as the Kimaroi and the Cymry, Ten tribes of Israel were known to the Assyrians as such. And then there's more about Phoenicians and this area and the area of Tarshish. And I'll skip through this so we can get to the end. And the ancient Assyrians knew them as the Camry and the Greeks knew them as the Kimaroi. Um, we can trace the Ark is in this book as well. If you haven't got the Ark of the Covenant book, 
there's a lot more on it here anyway. And all in all, I think it's just absolutely phenomenal because then if you know about Wilson and Blackett's work, what we then do, we go from this map where we're taking things from, just take the story a little bit further forward, just jump forward a little bit. After you have this uh, big war, the Trojan Wars kicking off around 650, the idea is then that some of these uh, uh, people go over to become the Etrurians, Etruria, Etruria in northern Italy, and up towards Raetia in Switzerland, and are forming some of these areas. And then at some point, probably about 500 BC, the great grandson of Aeneas, uh, uh, which is Brutus, so great grandson, nephew, Aeneas um, comes back. And there's four tribes it would seem from here, or broken into four units. And they're the people that get taken all the way over to Britain, with various stops on the way where you can see the language. So if you're not familiar with Wilson and Blackett's work, what you find is all on this migration route, you will see lettering that can be read using Welsh, including in Italy, the old Etruscan languages, which no one can read, apart from Wilson and Blackett, <laughs> all the way back through some of the islands here where you can see markers and stella that have been left. And we go all the way back to there, so there you go. That was what I was going to do on that one. Hang on, I, I've still got things open. I haven't. That's just another map to show the overall picture. And what I wanted to show is how close Egypt is in this battle area. Whoop. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that one. As I had, uh, before we wrap up on it, I just want to say about the Phoenicians again. If you go to Wikipedia, it does get very interesting when you read it. You see, it says here, it's an ancient, ancient Semitic speaking. I mean, all ties in again, doesn't it, with um, Lost Tribes, Cymru, the Tribes of Dan, all that kind of stuff. They know it's ancient Semitic speaking, Thessalocratic, a state with primarily maritime realms. There we are, Thessalocratic, sea-based. Uh, along the Levant, which um, is as far north as are, blah, 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 all the areas again. So we get Canaanite port towns. Now, there was something particularly... There we are, long considered a lost civilization due to the lack of indigenous written records. More recently, it's a complex and influential civilization. And their best legacy is the world's oldest verified alphabet, which they transmitted across the Mediterranean world. Mm. The Phoenician alphabet formed the basis of the Greek alphabet, which is in turn adopted for the Latin script. Now that ties in with the British accounts and Cumbric records giving the, the Greeks their language, going the other way. Okay. So there we are, that's the map we saw earlier. That's their roots and everything. So I'm quite, can I see more of the comments there on? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Galatians in Turkey were Celtic. Yes, thank you for that. That's from John Turney there. Yeah, the Galatians. Oh, thing earlier from the comments about how, about tin. Oh, the tin connections. Yeah, don't yeah, scroll tin. down a bit then, is it? Oh, there's loads of, loads of comments today. Thank you, Arnie. Yeah. Yes, okay. thank you. Um, Go on. Cornish tin was found in Israel, apparently. Cornish tin found in Israel. Yes, yeah. Oh, yeah, and also want to mention... Thank you, Arnie, yeah, because I was reading that. There's a, there's quite a chunk of that in this book, uh, Trojan War. Ah, now, look at this, you see. Look at this. Look at this now. <laughs> Thanks, Arnie. I wasn't set up to do this. And the comic came in, because I printed off my index. I can go... Hang on a second. Tin Islands and a tuff for tin. Tin, 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 tin islands, you see? And I can see there, tin islands. And there's the page numbers. I hope you can see that on the screen. No, because I left the map in the way. Hang on a second. Thanks, Arnie. <laughs> it's a shambles. Another few years I'll have a hang of this if I do 50 a year. Right, there you go. So you've got the tin islands across there, all right? So there's my page numbers. Um, okay, so what I can now do is... Yeah, because the, the whole point with the tin... If you want to make bronze, you need tin as well. There are other ways of doing it. Well, not there are other elements, but they're the main ones. Copper and tin. So what I can then do, you see, is get my book, and I can look up here and say, oh, yeah, there's all about the tin islands, and why Tarshish and all that kind of stuff. So this is why the index is, is, is very handy, all right? Now, what, what was referred to in the comment there is bang on the money... They've got records going back 
to really ancient times, there's clearly a link. And this is what I want people to really comment about and help me with, is two things, two questions I have. One, if all these people turned up from this area and went to Britain, and if you look at the stories then, it was Britain was divided into three. So you've got Cloiger for the English, Alban Scottish, Cymru Welsh. English seem to be Trojans mostly, according to this version of events. The Welsh, the Cymru, Scottish, Alban. So there's no conflict or anything, they just seem to be given those bits of land and either merged with the people who are already there, or, or what happened to those people? There's no conflict, apparently. So if you stuck at the tin trading, I don't know, is, could it be the case that actually there was um, a common people, both ends of the Mediterranean, who, who'd been trading the whole time and were actually the same sort of people? Because it does seem strange that you can just turn up with this large number of people and no one seem and take the best bits, if you like, take all the resources. So I think they must already have been connected, uh, which is validated by the finding of the tin trading back and forth, and the bronze and all these um, references to the tin islands. So how far back that goes, I'm interested to hear people's ideas on that. Have you got any more comments on that one? Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Arnie. Right. Oh, there's loads of stuff, yeah. We got, oh my goodness, I can't keep up with all of them. Can I just bring around here a bit so I can yeah. see? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very German. Right. Egyptian sailing boats are identical to Irish boats, says Alan Rees. And the Scythians are kicked out of Egypt and landed up in Ireland. Right, now again, you see. <laughs> I agree with that one. And what I will do now, because I've got my index... Well, I know, because I did the index. I'm going to put my glasses back on. That's the trouble with doing indexes for a living. You can't see anything afterwards. So you've got the Irish. What page they got their big mention on. And then also you've got something called the um, Erie Chronicles, which I'm sure Alan's well aware of. Erie, E-R-I. -I, uh, the Chronicles, which is all about the Irish origin stories. And if you go back then in your... Um, the Trojan War book, you follow the page numbers, you find it, and you can see exactly as being described here. And if I just pop the map on the screen, whoop, I don't need a map. They went out of Egypt and went that away, they went across uh, west. And one, yeah, and then they end up, if you follow their story, going through Pillars of Hercules and then on up into Ireland, and that's their origins. And I will do a video soon on who are the Irish and who are the Scottish, because that gets really interesting and does go back to ancient times. Wow, there's so much here. Brilliant, 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 brilliant. Tarshish was famous for tin, wasn't it? I don't know about Tarshish. I know Tarshish was famously wealthy. I didn't know the tin connection. That would certainly tie in with uh, the tin production in Cornwall. I mean, it's a great thing about Britain. I'm just going to make a, you know, go off on a side thing a minute. Have you ever played any of those computer games like um, Civilization or, or any of these games? What you do is you start off with a small number of people and that's about it. And you have to develop the resources, like find the local precious metals, food, build houses, and gradually people move in and you build this and you end up with a spaceship, you know? It's a bit uh, 2001. Oh, Arnie's scrolling through now. Thanks, Arnie. Anyway, the point of that game is you want to start off in the area with the most resources. That's If you ever play that game, that's the way to do it. So, if you look at this logically, where would history most likely begin? What's going to be the most developed country? For example, are the countries most likely to develop amazing metalworking and copper working, for example, going to come from a country that has copper? Or from hundreds of miles away in a place where they don't have copper? I mean, to me, it makes perfect sense. If you've got the materials, you're going to be the ones developing the materials, surely. I don't see how it could happen any other way, because if the other people suddenly, what well, they do, come over, take some, take it back, work out this new technology, and at some point you say, oh, that's a good idea, we'll do it with our stuff. Well, when you look at the map of the resources, the allocation between Britain, compared to places like Iraq or Syria, all these great ancient countries, even Egypt, you look at somewhere like... Uh, uh, west of Britain, Wales, and Cornwall, and West Scotland, particularly, it is so mineral-rich. It's just 
ridiculous. You got the best quality anthracite coal. You got copper. You got all the tin mines. You've got the massive lead production in North Wales, and from lead you get the silver production. You've got the quick lime you need for building. You've got the trees. I mean, if you're playing a computer game or a simulation, we had to start off with a new country. That's the one you want. It's got everything. So it seems a little strange somehow that this primitive backwater, I uh, was just sitting there, you know, waiting for someone to come in and say, oh, this way you put a brick on top of another one, you know. They say you make a wall and whatever. Anyway, hello, Bethany. I haven't seen you for a while. And Patricia, smiling, everyone's laughing. Yeah, onto Joseph Aram, a theory in Cardiff. So anyway, people have to think about that. Why are the Irish so mute about links with Wales? I think that the gold torch in Dublin Museum originated in Welsh gold mines, pre-Roman. Interesting. If you go through the book Trojan Wars and a lot of the other writings, there seems to be a lot of contact between the Welsh and the Irish, but it always seems to be a bit like that. It's not very friendly very often. <laughs> Seem to be been at war before they left the Middle East and ever since, as far as I can tell. And um, apart from being kindred Celtic brothers, because they're not Celtic anyway, they seem to have happily been at war with each other for three and a half, four thousand years. <laughs> That's how I see it. What is written out of history, though, and I can see on there, um, and this, yes, it's a very good point. I'm, I'm getting the point of the question now. Because what you will find is that at various periods in history, big chunks of Ireland were captured and occupied by um, the Welsh. Look at the story of Cerredig. He was a couple of generations before Arthur II. He went over there and carved out an empire. I say an empire, a kingdom in southeast Ireland. And sure enough, there's a Roman fort. It's called a Roman fort, just outside Dublin, which no one can explain, because we know the Romans never went there, and the Irish didn't build it. Well... This idea the British couldn't build square buildings or forts is just bizarre or mad. I mean, if you go back to Tro Trojan Wars, and they're massive forts and castles. Of course they did. And if they're kindred spirits with the Romans, and they fought the Romans for hundreds of years, or worked with them, or jointly ruled the empire, whichever version of events you prefer, they'd have picked up by then a lot of tricks on how to do these things. So Wilson and Blackett suggest that that fort just outside Dublin is actually a British fort and it's evidence of British occupation of southeastern Ireland. And this is when you come to the story then, where the, the descendants of that kingdom in Ireland were married into uh, one of Arthur's cousins, and this is why you get the story of Brecheniog, or Brechen, coming back to Brecon, cousin of Arthur, and occupying that area. It wasn't the case where the Irish just allowed to just, just walk through Wales. Just, just walk through West Wales, walk through, you can have Brecon and all the people. Why, why would this happen? Again, his story being flipped on its head. So what do you have a situation where in in um, in Wales, for political reasons, everything's Irish and you get rid of the local history, whereas in Ireland, everything's also Irish and you get rid of the foreign history. So this is one of the things that needs to be readjusted a little bit of... Because um, it's also true that Ireland took chunks of Wales at different times and raided the coast. And they came in and were pushed out and the Welsh went into Ireland and were pushed out. So it's a bit of one of those kind of uh, brotherly love type situations. I've no idea what time it is. And unfortunately... <laughs> thank you very much. There we are, just about an hour. Because uh, the boys are going to go back to school for a day tomorrow. Yeah, lockdown relaxed for one day anyway. In Wales, they get one day of school. Yay, Yay you are very excited, aren't you, on? So we can't be too late. Right, Welsh is Irish of people. That's interesting, I didn't know that before. Okay, um, so that's about the Irish, the mutes, leaks with the, the Welsh with the Welsh. People. Not just for people. About the word for people. No, Welsh, it says the Welsh is the Irish for Welsh people. Ah, okay. The Irish call the Welsh Welsh. Okay, interesting, right, okay. Um, right, are the, t sorry, Nikki Griffiths, earlier comment, are the Turkish Galatians connected to the Spanish Galatians, the northwest of Spain? Great question, because if you follow your conventional history books, you'll hear this amazing story how these Galatians or Celtiberians, you've got this changed the name slightly, 
with this awesome fighting force, and they were so devastating. They smashed their way all the way across here, across here, across here, across here. No one could stop them. They smashed their way, smashed their way, smashed their way, smashed their way, and ended up in uh, in the other side, in the Turkish Galatia. And it's the same people gone that way. An amazing story. You ask a historian of ancients, uh, and that's how they'll tell you the connection is. More logical connection, which fits with the um, Wilson and Blackett view of the world and the British history, is that the migration came from here. So some have gone up around the Black Sea, some have gone to the Balkans, uh, some have become Etruscans, and then the rest have come all the way around and landed, some in uh, Iberia, or uh, the Galatians are supposed to be in this area up here, northwest Spain. And it would seem, Wilson and Blackett's account, that they were picked up on the way. So they must have got there beforehand. So it would seem like there was some sort of trading network. I'm pointing at a map and no one can see it except me. I just realised. <laughs> All right, okay, we'll do that again, okay? So the Galatians, I believe, are in this part of northwest Spain. Oh, it's made Arnie's evening, that has. And then the traditional story is they fought their way, fought their way, bashed up everybody. No one could stop them, smashed up, I don't know, where was in the way, Romans and... Greeks and Macedonians, out the way, out the way, we're coming through. And they finally settled down here somewhere in sort of Turkish Galatian area. And it's something they called Celtiberians. Now, of course, the other way of looking at it is the Wilson Blackett type world and the British records of histories is it come the other way, where the migration starts from here. Some have gone to Italy. And then the idea is some of these, this is curious, because some are supposed to be already in this area, northwestern Spain. And they were sort of collected on the way and came back to Britain. So it was seen this trading network, like you talked about before with the tin, was all linked up previously. And this might have been a good stop-off point. Because when we talk about Joseph of Arimathea, slightly like changed the subject, when he jumps out from Jerusalem, possibly via Egypt, and then tries to escape the Roman Empire back to Britain, Mary and the Holy Family and Joseph are some accounts supposed to have landed in Southern France, which would tie in with the trade routes, because you've got the rivers here, top of my head, the Rhona, I think. And they made this way up there, and they hitch a lift on the other river and come across that way and avoid this dangerous and long journey around Spain. So there's, a, there's sort of a shorter land. There's rivers, basically, you fall that way. So you, you I, I would have thought the trade routes would have gone possibly that way as well, be easier. So you are a bit curious, these guys, the Silesians or Celtiberians. Is anyone the um Right, okay. A second links links to Wales apart from St. Patrick, never widely known in Ireland. There are surnames like Brunnock, which means Welshman. Most of the Normans that evaded Lem sixty nine with three quarters of Welsh, yes. I love that because I used to do war gaming. Not too so much now, but I will I'll probably get back into it again. And there's always talk about this um Anglo Norman invasion of Ireland. <laughs> There's half a dozen Normans and a load of Welsh bowmen and tough guys, and that was it. There wasn't exactly a massive army, but there was definitely no Angles or Anglos. Because that's always a joke when you have like an Anglo-American agreement, isn't it? There's about, is it 3-4% of the population of Britain is, or UK is uh, Angle? So when you do an Anglo-whatever deal, who's actually involved in that? It took 30 days to get from Wales to Roman horsepower. Oh, there we are, that's a good, I didn't know that. They left southern Iberia because they were felt unwelcome and surrounded by hostile tribes, quite possibly. And also I would think if it was part of this kind of uh, trade route, because I think you're saying the southern side Iberia could have been here as well. To my mind, they look like stopping off points. If you're running a ship, and you are going to go around Spain rather than through France. You need a stop off point, you need a stop off point, you're going to need another one around here somewhere. Uh, you know, you're going to need either via Italy or this way, because those ships would need to pull in. Well, usually every night they'd pull in, if they could, and haul, a be haul the boats up. I mean, one much room for sleeping and stuff on those boats, you know. it's They're not really designed, so you need lots of stop-offs. So it makes sense to say, right, that's it. This this trade across the Mediterranean of tin, primarily, and maybe whatever's going back the other way, is being wrapped up a bit, and you, you don't want really to be stuck in these little colonies then, do you? You're like, yes, get me out of here, I want to go home. Okay, what else we got here? Wow, there's so many comments tonight. It's been so busy. Brilliant. Thank you very much. 
Yep, I haven't had a chance of much friendly. Oh, someone's going to court. All right, don't know much about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So John Tierney's also mentioned the Galatians in Turkey. We think we covered that one, didn't we? The Celtiberians. This Celtic word again. And um, we'll do some more about Colburn. Hey, while I've got so many people online as well, can we also please have some comments about what areas to go through next week and June a week? Because I'm doing loads of videos at the moment. I can't go through all these. Um... Yes, as Robert Pierce says, isn't it funny how the Cymru... The Lost Tribes, the Kimaroi, the Kimerians, the Luians, all lived in the same place at around the same time, and historically all vanish around 650 to 500 BC. Hmm. It's funny. If you go, I would highly recommend on YouTube, go and look up. Well, let's go back to me again. It's all about me. So when you go back to, um, go and look at the Luians. If you do YouTube, there's one, uh, I've forgotten his name off the top of my head, Robert something, a doctor. He's a really convincing speaker, he's very good. And the way they talk about these Luwians, how mysterious it all is, is fascinating. And it's like, I'm dying, I, I've got to send him a letter or something and say, you know all these mysteries, <laughs> if you just move Trojan War to 650, and have you ever heard of the British or the Cymric and the stories? You just drop them in, and it all makes perfect sense, and there's no mystery at all. Ah, it's quite bizarre. It really is. Do Troy next time, if you can. I think we should, Alexandra, shouldn't we? Oh, the Mirth Research. Oh, yeah, yeah, we're going to do that during the week. That's a complicated one. Yeah, who said that about the Mirth Research? Andrew Whelan. And I gave a little, little, oh, my goodness. We got the whole thing about, um, I mentioned it before, about Kavartha, what Mirth means. All the places round there. That's where I was up on summer solstice, just across from Merthyr. Uh, where you can see the whole procession of the sun and the rebirth, the whole ceremony mapped out. Yes, that'll need a... I, I struggled to do that one live. <laughs> I need to really get everything lined up for that, a lot of graphics and stuff. The real Merlin, about the red man and the red horse, were in a red cloak. Yes, 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 good idea. And Greg Hallett made an interesting... Oh, yeah, interviews! Yep. Thank you, Matt Taylor. Thank you, thank you. There were two Jesuses. Of course, it reminded me of the two King Arthurs. Yes. Um, I don't know if maybe it's his twin, Didymoth. I don't know. Yeah, interviews. Other thing I'm going to try and do from next week onwards. I might try it on a non-live one first, okay? I think we got the technology in place to do some conversations or interviews. So if anyone would like to come in and talk... Come in. I'm going to go anyway. Just pick up the phone, all right? <laughs> And we could talk in the show rather than just me, just my voice all the time. Uh, so I've got a couple of people I'm hoping to talk to about their research and where it's at. So there's a couple of people, for example, who've worked on the astronomy thing, the mounds, Mirtha. And I try and get Alan Wilson on board, I can't promise, or Barham. They've been a bit grumpy at the moment because they've been locked up in this isolation for a long time. So I'm, I am praying that the restrictions come off and I can go up there. And get a face-to-face -face interview as well. Because I didn't go up until they're happy with it. Because of the restrictions and all that. But I want to get more people on. And also, another thing which this has reminded me of. Please, please, please. If you've got anything you want to make a video about. Make it. Please do it. The channel's called Britain's Hidden History. I put my name on there just to make you stand out. But this Britain's Hidden History, it's a group idea. If you go to the Facebook page, you'll see... I reckon I'm not even 20% now of all the new posts and the new topics, and it's fantastic. That's how it should be. I really need to be only 20% of the videos at some point. If you film something or you visit a site, don't worry about it being great. It doesn't have to be. Let's just get it up there. This is a team effort, all right? We really want... It's, my whole philosophy about this is to share the information and get everyone involved. It's only by numbers and, and uh, mass awareness that we're going to ever get anywhere doing this, okay? There's some great people in this group. They can do just as good as me or better on these videos and stuff. And it hasn't got to be an hour-long presentation like this. Ten-minute film of your local mound and what you think about it and maybe some references from a book. That would be tremendous. You know? So, yes, getting Alan and Barham on would be amazing. Yeah, we'll get them on. <laughs> 
How about the Etruscan stone in Colburn refers to the Ark in the little box? Right, Colburn. That is going to be a tough one because I want to do a book on Colburn. And, um, yeah, all right. <laughs> I should, I'll try and show everyone how Colburn works. Let's write this down, Arnie, before we forget. How Colburn works. It's quite, it's very clever. And it's taken me a while of looking at it and looking at it and looking at it. And suddenly one of those pennies just went, oh, yeah, I can see, I can see now. I still can't just read it fluently. Hieroglyphics, I can read them pretty fluently. Oh, yeah, another thing, please. Um, and try and do little bite size uh, camerglyphics. You know, you can read hieroglyphs using Welsh, which sort of fits in with this whole migration thing. Because the same language has ended up in Wales. And everywhere else, the language has got messed up by invasions and wars and migrations. Was in Wales, the Welsh have pretty much just sat on the edge of Europe, being the Welsh for a couple of thousand years, and the language hasn't changed much until recent times. That's another story which gets me quite angry, but there you go. As long as you've got a dictionary a couple of hundred years old, you can read hieroglyphics. Pretty easy, actually. It takes you about half an hour to learn, I would say. So I want to do more on that. And people have started sending me... I know uh, if Dixie's out there, and Darren, you sent, and uh, Rob, and a couple of others, ages ago you sent me how you've done your names in hieroglyphs and things you've translated. Please, everyone, and you send them again. I want to start doing more of those on videos and showing what other people have done. It's not about me, this video. It's about the work of Wilson and Blackett. And more than that, even, it's about the history and the message and getting it across. If you've got somebody you want to show, this is a platform. It's there. You know, over to you situation, all right? So please send through some more. Because uh, Vince, Vince Burke, sent this week, posted on the Facebook group, a beautiful picture of some hieroglyphs for translation, and it was lovely, you know? It all worked out easy, and it was great. All right. Arnie has done a good job tonight. <laughs> yeah, well done, Arnie. Yeah, it's amazing that it hasn't all gone wrong, isn't it? I hope he wants to say something now. It's all going to go wrong now. Go on, you can have your thing back in here. So obviously, I can't see the comments at the moment. Oh, mind you, I could do, couldn't I? I could go on to the... Oh, no, don't mess with it, Ross. I get Arnie telling me off now if I mess with it. There we are. You're going to have to use your left hand only. Go on, you can take that back, Anne. Thank you, thank you, says Arnie. Yeah, okay. Right. And I think it's going to be time for bed soon, isn't it? It's no, going it's tomorrow. Not. Yeah. no, it's not. No, it's not. It's not. There's going to be... Uh, there we are. Ah, good fun. Right, okay, I'll leave the comments on again. And uh, if anyone's got any more questions, please, please, please put them on the comments. Or send me a message. I get loads of emails now. So I do apologise to people if I've been a bit slow replying. Because I get a lot of emails every day. I do my best. And as you know, it's been a horrible week. And I've fallen behind a bit. So I'm catching up on that. And I love to get the messages. And it's great. Share as much as possible, though. I can't emphasise this enough. When we're doing the thing with the Star Mounds, I managed to find six different people contacted me. They were all doing their own work. All in different direct, all um, coming from different directions, all with different areas of expertise, and we did some of them. We did for decades, decades, and working in the caves no good though, because there's only so far I could go, and the progress is very slow. Right. Once these people came together, and I've got them on a little email group, and there's, I mean, I, some of it's that's why I can't do a Mirtha presentation just like that, because some of it's so clever. I need to, I have to spend some serious time just learning it all. It's really impressive what they've done. And they've all, all the people involved have said they've made, you know, more progress in the last few weeks than they did in years of working alone. You need other people to bounce ideas off and discuss, all right? So don't be nervous about bringing forward something. If you've got an idea, questions, or you've got a video you want to show, please. It's, that's what it's all about. We've got to grow this. It's very exciting. It's like a whole new, um, pool, 10 subjects. Right, Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Arnie. Are you done? No, oh, he's typing something here. Smash that notification bell. I don't even think I've got a notification bell, have I? Pardon? Have I even got a notification bell? Yes, yeah, by the subscribe button. I've got the headphones on. It's <laughs> shouting. It's by the subscribe button. <laughs> All right, next to the subscribe button. If you hit that bell, you've got to smash the bell, my children tell me. Because that means that every time I put a video up, you get a notification sent to your email address. All right? Okay, anyway, so hang on a uh, Dane John Mound in Canterbury uh, could well be. Yeah, please, please, please don't think this is just a Welsh project. It really isn't. As you know, last week we did a whole thing on who were the English. And I wanted the Irish, Scottish, 
and we've got Canterbury. Um, as anyone, if I would recommend everybody read a copy of uh, Prehistoric London, E.O. Gordon, which used an academic book originally written about 1914. There's loads of stuff there, particularly about, if you're asking about Canterbury, that whole area, London and the southeast, what the things were there for, you know? Um, like the fact that London is a series of mounds that are artificial. I didn't realise that Realize that until I read the book. Uh, where did I used to live? Near Primrose Hill and Parliament Hill. And, they, you know, this is correct, this idea of the seven hills again, and they're artificial to get there. And, of course, you've got the seven hills of Rome, possibly Troy, it's hard to tell. And this seems to be part of their uh, kind of uh, thing, part of their thing that they did. So, yeah, Clandin, yeah, the Clandin could be the Jonathan, thank you, the Holy Lake. Have you heard that London has a Welsh origin? Well, I call it a British origin. I think it's more like to be a uh, Floiger than Welsh, but I mean the language, definitely. Clandin, uh, E.O. Gordon says Holy Lake, doesn't he? See, the TV celebrities <laughs> have a competitor. Oh, please, no. The TV celebrities. Excellent. Yeah, pick one. I used to be... Uh, what well, he's called me Fred Flintstone at college. <laughs> so that's what a TV personality. Yabba dabba do. Right, okie dokie. So um, I'll leave the comments running. And uh, if I can work all this out. Thank you, Arnie. Yes, thank you, everyone. It's been great. I'm so pleased to see all the comments. So many people coming on board. Please spread the word. If you want to contact me during the week, ross at cameraglyphics.com email address. Send me a message there. Uh, that'd be great. Or the Facebook group, or um, any way you can. Letters. I love letters. People have, I've had. I'm the only person I know who actually gets physical, typed and handwritten letters through the post, and I will reply to every letter I receive. I love letters. Remember to put your address on, okay? Let's go back to old fashioned letter writing. It's fantastic. Uh, right, okay, so I'm going to try. And if you'd excuse me, I'm going to leave a little bit of music playing if I can. Oh no. Oh, technology's good. Oh, no, you're all going to watch me do this now. Make a real mess of it as well. Uh, play, play, play. Come on, where is it? I can't see anything. Yay. Right, okay. Hopefully that's not too loud. And I, uh, we'll carry on with the comments. And I'll pop in a bit later when everyone's gone, uh, totally gone to bed. Everything's cool. So thank... Oh, yeah, one other thing. God, there's always one other thing, isn't there? But it's there. What I want to talk about just briefly was thank you everybody for being so generous with the money towards getting Wilson and Blackett a new computer. The collection's gone so well in the first week. I haven't been up to update because of the family things. But it's gone so well, they're going to go and get a printer as well and get them back online and get them sorted out. So that's fantastic. And if you want to help ongoing, all the revenue I get from books and anything, it's all split with them. You can help those. And there's now a Patreon account available as well, where you can uh, uh, become a regular contributor on there. Be nice, just say three pounds a month, something like that. Just basically buy a pint. Does three pound buy a pint anymore? <laughs> I don't even know. Can anyone remember what pubs look like? Oh, slowly, Ross. Okay, so please enjoy the music, everyone. Till next time. <laughs> I almost definitely. has got the phones on. I almost definitely. Don't tell anyone, child cruelty. <laughs> Sorry, Art. Sorry, everyone who's just got headphones. Bye. Till next time. Hedu. Oh, try again. Thank you, Arnie B. Bye, everyone. See you during the week. Keep up the good work. I can't button to press. Living fast, spinning round. Oh, it will, not it? I know it's gone black on here. Yeah. Who wrote these lyrics, man? Oh. Hang on, it won't be black for much longer. I'm sorry about this. It's a 
something has happened. I've lost my air. Uh, oh well. The drive all my pictures is saved as gone. Let's put a nice picture up. Let's put a nice picture up. Quick, quick, quick. Oh, there you go. There you go, here's some of the trenches from... Around when he's bathing where the battles were. I'll be for a moment, I'll come back later. Just to switch everything down. And have a good evening, have a good night. And please, lots more videos in the week. Stay in touch, I might even do a live one during the week. So, Nostali, Poplut, Heluch. Bend of a backwards to please. Is this all for real? Yes, indeed. Tins of punters Slide and a night dream Come up to one no meeting So say I Thought you were So say
Take a look at the car we have The sun is shining Why would it burn? Muriel Take a look at the car we have The sun is shining Why would it burn? Conversation Broken all the pieces Seek concentration in ancient lands Early dawn is blue No offense out But for Could not be 